Okay, looks good. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you uh, for inviting me, and it's wonderful to be here. This is a little bit different. Um, it's more like an overview of what we're up to and a direction that ontology development will be taking in the next uh, few years, I'd say. There's a bit of a provocative title, but I hope it lives up to it. The main goal here is to link the life science, the bio hackathon, to things that are happening in earth science and planetary science that's happening in other communities out there, which I'll talk about soon. So, if I ever figure out how to use this, there we go. So the two ontologies, many of you know me from the development of two ontologies primarily. Um, the SDG interface ontology, Sustainable Development Goals, which I develop in collaboration with the UN Environment for the SDG agenda until 2030, and the Environment Ontology, which is an oval foundry ontology um, that deals with environmental entities, ecosystems, mountains, rivers, seas, etc. Yeah. So those two are oval ontologies that interoperate, and they're covering things from socio-economic systems to ecology to environments and geology, etc. So the mission. Um, the broad mission of this presentation and where the biohackathon mission fits is to build a robust semantic layer to allow your tools and your uh, technologies to interact with, to query across um, earth science and life science. We work with domain experts wherever we can, people who really know about their glaciers or their mountains, etc. And we also work with application developers who want to build things on top of it to tell us if something's working or not. Um, where I work at the Alfred Wegener Institute, we're concerned with the Arctic. And we have a lot of data types in our observatory, just in the Fram Strait between uh, Svalbard. So we have uh, observatories that go from the sea ice down to five kilometers in the sea floor. All sorts of robots and things pumping out data. We also have satellite telemetry coming in, and also ship cruises with our icebreaker to sample microbial genomes and sequence the genomics from the uh, surface waters down to the deep sea and the sediments. So a lot of data types are coming in. And of course, we're trying to feed into global systems that are trying to create variables that allow people to monitor the planet. So the ones that we're concerned with primarily are the essential ocean variables run by the Global Ocean Observing System, or GOOSE, um, which is run by the IOC of UNESCO, so the Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission. That nests within a family of these essential variables for climate, for biodiversity, for things, for all of those things that are essentially trying to report to policymakers and policy analysts what we find out as scientists in a condensed way. So there's a lot of activity in the development of these things. It's as complicated as it sounds and very frustrating. Um, right. So essentially, if you were in the Starship Enterprise and you, you sort of found a new planet and you want to see what it's like, you want your computer to give you a summary of what that planet is like. And that's what those essential variables are. And semantics play a role in that because, again, those ontologies, ENVO, SDGIO, and a few others, are providing the semantic interfaces to those variables as we build out this system. So we're building the Star Trek computer. It's going to happen. So I thought about, hey, what's a good, what is a good example to talk about? And then I was watching a, um, a, a series, a National Geographic series, on the plane ride over here, and it provided a perfect example. One of the episodes, a really good episode, I like this one, um, it started talking about how there was an outbreak on the Mars colony. And they embed this with real documentaries coming from Earth. And they put up an example from the Yamal uh, Peninsula over in Russia, where there was an outbreak of anthrax because the permafrost is thawing. So global warming is warming up up there. Permafrost is thawing, and old diseases are coming back. Some of those spores, bacterial spores, can last for about 70 years, 75 years. And as it warms, these things are coming up. And remember, it's not just reindeer that are down there. There are also human bodies that are very old that are still there. So there's going to be new uh, biological threats emerging due to planetary processes. So this is where it is, the Yamal Peninsula. It's part of the Nenets Autonomous Region. The Nenets are the uh, indigenous people over there. And a lot of them also died as a result of the anthrax outbreak. It wasn't hundreds, but it was quite a few. Information's a bit sketchy, as we'll see in a moment. Um, and it's not just, it's not just uh, the anthrax that's coming out. As the permafrost thaws, methane is released, and there are these spontaneously huge explosions in that area of the tundra. Massive craters just form. And in ENVO, we, we, we encoded that some time ago, this idea of a permafrost methane explosion. So now our task is to bridge that to the things like the anthrax outbreaks, the biology that's driven by planetary scale change processes. So that's in there, and we bridge, of course, with other ontologies like HEBI, to sort of allow machines to query around that. Um, again, it, it keeps going. That heat wave is there. 
this reiteration, in other words, it got some media coverage. And what was interesting, well, interesting and sad, of course, is that this is a true intersection. Humans are infected, it has an ecological impact, um, and an entire culture is at risk there. Um, the Nanets require their reindeer as their main source of income and livelihoods, and it's a core cultural reference. So it's a, it's a thing to do. Of course, the military was de deployed to uh, try to contain the situation. Um, and how did they do that? They burned the reindeer carcasses to sterilize them, as you would expect. Um, again, you can see satellite imagery or aerial imagery of the burning of the reindeer. But let's not forget, there are methane explosions happening in the Arctic, and the Arctic is burning. So again, we have to start intersecting these data systems, because our, our measures to deal with that are really modulated by one another. Right. That's the point. We need to start to link these, and our ontology development, again, which we hope that your tools can leverage, is going in that direction to try to bring these communities together. Now, we have the Oval Foundry for Biology and Ecology. We're, we're pretty good there. We can make some progress. But we need to make new allies. Again, this is like Star Trek. We have a new star system. We need to make new allies to help us on our quest and go into Earth and planetary sciences. And so we found them in the Earth Science Information Partners, ESIP. So that was founded by NASA, NOAA, and USGS, much larger now, lots of uh, um, communities. And they have a semantic technologies committee. Um, I co-chair that committee now. And our mission is to try to bridge these two worlds. Um, the course Semantics in ESIP was founded on SWEET, or the Semantic Web for Earth and Environment Technology. Um, it was set up by Rob Raskin. Um, it's really a massive project. It's more SCOS level at the moment, but it sketches out basically the semantic domains which Earth science is going to concern itself with. And that's what the Semantic Tech Committee and others are going to be developing, uh, developing out and increasing the semantic density of. So we're building that knowledge graph with socioeconomic development, biological processes, as you go, ESIP and ENVO and others to try to thicken that layer of environmental processes and other collaborators to try to answer bigger questions and allow um, informatics to bridge databases from life sciences to databases from planetary science. Right. So how are we, how are we doing this? Well, inspired by the Biohackathon series, we started a cryo-hackathon series with cryo <laughs> experts, so uh, glaciologists and others, and we intend to expand that. We're, extend, um, we're expanding that with people from the World Meteorological Organization, Global, Global Cryosphere Watch, and others. Um, right now we have experts, um, scientific experts, but soon we'll be engaging with indigenous leaders too and indigenous knowledge systems to get that in there to help the human side of the problem um, in the cryosphere. So that's happening, um, and it's also being extended out to marine uh, clusters soon. And so we plan to do this. We'll have cryo hackathons, uh, seismo hackathons, you name it, to try to set it up um, based on that now. So thank you, Toshiaki and others, for the bio hackathon series because it's making impacts in the earth sciences too. So this is what we're up to. We're adding semantics of permafrost. Not everybody agrees on what permafrost is or what it means to have permafrost thawing. So there's lots of semantic ambiguity. Um, also, the processes that are involved in permafrost, even it's the thawing processes that release methane and again, feed those explosions downstream. So lots of work to do to thicken out that layer. Right, so how do we actually feed this into data analysis? I'm going to switch here and talk about marine microbiomes for a moment. Same principle could apply to any planetary sector. I'll be talking a little bit about the work in, happening in the Hurwitz lab with Planet Micro. It's a leveraging cyber infrastructure to mobilize microbiome data and combine that with their uh, technology stack. A lot of this work is done by my former student, Kai Blumberg, who won this year's ESIP Raskin Scholarship. And he's adding a semantic, uh, ser semantic services and capabilities to Planet Micro to use ontologies like ENVO to mobilize data. So what happens? Very high level. Grab sequences from the uh, INSTC, analyze it with a whole stack of different, pipe sorry, different pipelines, and then use semantics to mobilize that data for some multivariate statistical analysis. So that's what happened. Grabs the database, uh, grabs the metagenomes of the metadata, uses ENVO and gene ontology products, amongst others, to allow cross queries and an analysis. So, for example, you can ask questions like what cellular amino acid biosynthesis processes differentiate two biomes that are in ENVO? This is a non metric dimensional scaling of the data he gets out of planet microbes, and indeed you can detect signatures. So, that's the deep sea has a particular signature. This is toy data, so you know, don't read too deeply into that, but it's a proof of principle. And that's the direction in which we'll move. 
So that's it. My mission for the biohackathon is to focus on your questions. So if there's any environmental context you'd like me to work on, happy to do it and uh, happy to develop more in that direction. Too many people to thank, so logos for organizations of people. Uh, thank you for your attention.